now I turn to Kiran Opal. Kiran has been with the, she's the found, co-founder of the Ex-Muslims uh, Forum of uh, North America and has also helped the Ex-Muslims Forum here in Britain and edits the Ex-Muslims blog. Kiran. Uh, wow, what an amazing weekend this has been. Um, the speakers, performers, the hosts, the audience members, everyone has been phenomenal. I want to thank the organizers and all the volunteers who've put this together, this weekend full of meaningful discussions, heartfelt personal stories, and humor. <laughs> um, since 2008, I've been working with a team of dedicated and resourceful people to run the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain's online forum and its associated social media, including its YouTube channel that has over 2.2 million views, and its Twitter account that currently has over 13,000 followers. In September last year, a handful of friends and I, we co-founded the organization Ex-Muslims of North America, or XMNA, and we've set up uh, local meetup groups in 11 cities in just over a year, and it, the group continues to grow. In just a few years, I've seen the idea of apostasy from Islam grow exponentially. And today there are a number of open, public, ex-Muslim free thinkers who are writing, blogging, podcasting, doing interviews, speaking on panels at conferences, and generally putting their names, faces, and voices out there. This is not to say that we are all alike. In fact, this is important. I can't say that any one of us speaks for all people who have left Islam. Each of us really only speaks to our own experiences, although there are definitely commonalities. Still, the fact that there are so many diverse ex-Muslim voices out there now, and the number keeps growing, is something I cherish very much because I clearly remember the time before all of this. I was born and raised in Pakistan. I lived there and in the U.S. for many years before I settled in Canada. I had questions about Islam from a young age, aspects like the second-class status of women in its scriptures, the insane concept of hell and eternal torture, and the general questions about things like, if God made everything, then who made God, etc. After trying to silence those questions in myself, I realized at the age of 18 that I just was not cut out for this religion thing. So back in the late 1990s, when the internet was just learning to crawl and dial-up was the norm and Google was not yet born, I, I thought I was the only person in the world to have realized I couldn't believe in Islam anymore, that I was not Muslim anymore. Islam is taught to most of us from Muslim backgrounds in a way that it becomes woven into the very basic fabric of our identity. This is why one of the most common statements every ex-Muslim makes at some point or another is, I thought I was the only one. Over the last six years that I've been involved in this movement, I've personally gotten to know a few thousand ex-Muslims online and offline, and that is the most common line that almost all of them say at some point or another. In the next few minutes, I will suggest some ideas about why I think this is so. Probably more than any other religion practiced today, Islam permeates every aspect of life, from our spiritual concerns to daily habits, like what to eat, what to wear, who to associate with, even how to go to the bathroom. <laughs> when every aspect of your being is ruled by an ideology, that ideology comes to define your being. In this way, Islam defines, for many Muslims, the very act of being human. And of course, the flip side of Muslim equals human is non-Muslim equals non-human. If you study anthropology, which is what I did, um, great, great career move, um, you see that every human civilization or social group um, has its own set of in-group and out-group parameters. All humans have a tendency towards tribalism, towards us versus them thinking to various degrees including atheists, <laughs> some atheists. For Islamists, this matter is taken to an extreme and given divine sanction. Islam defines all outsiders as kafir, a concept that, whose implications are deeply misunderstood by those who are outside. For both the violent types of Islamists like Daesh, also known as the Islamic State in Syria, Syria and Iraq, 
and those supposedly non-violent Islamists who go around trying to institute Sharia law and promote da'wah or Islamic evangelism while holding social views that belong in the seventh century. The kafir is a kind of subhuman category. The Quran uses the term kafir 482 times in various derivations to describe non-Muslims, particularly pagan non-Muslims. It makes special dispensations for Christians and Jews, although nowadays they tend to get lumped in with the poor pagans too. The, the word kafir technically means someone who denies or covers up the truth. And the truth, of course, is presumed to be Islam. So Islam believes that Islam is the only truth. Uh, the problem is that the violent sectarianism that we have been hearing about from Barbez Hootboy and so many other speakers is so deeply enmeshed in Islam and its history that while claiming that the Muslim Ummah is made up of a billion or more people and constitutes the fastest growing religion, which is a dubious claim itself, most Muslim sects, sects actually don't recognize large sections of that Ummah as Muslim in the first place. Besides the big Shia Sunni split, there are multiple splits within those two groups. Then there are the Ahmadis and the Sufis and subsects within those as well. And members of most of these groups will be quick to tell you that all those other groups don't follow the real Islam. <laughs> the Catholic Church and other Christian denominations excommunicated people for centuries and still do, though much less intensely. Islam in a way democratized the practice of excommunication. This, pra <laughs> this practice is called takfir in Arabic. So any ordinary Muslim, not just clergy, but any Muslim can declare another Muslim. So anybody who claims to be Muslim can declare another person who claims to be Muslim a non-Muslim or a kafir. So for, no for, no uh, for most Muslims, being labeled a kafir by another Muslim feels like one has committed a kind of treason to one's family and community. So Daesh and other Islamist terrorist groups rely on the doctrine of takfir or calling somebody else a kafir. They rely on that as their ideological basis. This is how they justify to themselves and to their new recruits the massacring not just of non-Muslims but also of thousands of people who identify as Muslim whether they're Sunni or Shia or Ahmadi, Kurd or any, anyone else. So each group's ever narrowing definition of Muslim, which is to say ever narrowing definition of human, marks everyone else in the world as kafir or subhuman who doesn't deserve the same rights. It is a terribly derogatory term on par with any horrible racial slur that's used to dehumanize an entire group. This is the paradox at the heart of religious identity politics and its liberal apologism. Do people have the right to self-identification? Do we accept that anyone who claims to be Muslim is in fact Muslim? Well, anthropologist Talal Assad from uh, the City University of New York writes in his essay called Anthropology of Islam, a Muslim's beliefs about the beliefs and practices of others are his own beliefs. So that's part of most Muslims' beliefs is who is and isn't a Muslim, what is a real Muslim, what is real Islam. So we are left with a dilemma faced by so many well-meaning liberals that awkward situation of having to accommodate beliefs that are themselves unaccommodating in the name of accommodating all beliefs. As those who chose to leave Islam, ex um, the ex-Muslims are often seen as having devolved, having debased themselves to become a kafir. In other words, having betrayed their very humanity. This choice is naturally, and for a good reason, seen as a threat to the supremacist thinking promoted by Islamism, that Islam is the only, and is not only the best religion, but it is the natural state of humanity, which is also why Muslims use the word revert, some Muslims, when they refer to converts. So it's no wonder the people who leave Islam, whether they call themselves ex-Muslim, apostate, or anything else, they tend to face social ostracism, sometimes to the extreme. They tend to face isolation from family members, emotional blackmail, alienation from younger siblings, and their own children if they have them, and financial abuse. What kind of twisted evil person voluntarily gives up his or her humanity? Every ex-Muslim has thought after they left Islam that they were the only one. 
With the internet now, it's becoming much easier to find other like-minded people, but the sense of isolation in new, in new apostates is still strong, especially in their immediate surroundings, among their families, their neighborhoods, and their friends. Just yesterday, I met two siblings who've lived for, the same in, for years in the same household as closeted atheists, but both thinking they were alone in their apostasy. And this is not a unique situation. Every once in a while, we hear of an honor killing or suicide, but death is only the extreme scenario. More and more, more often, many ex-Muslims live with a steady barrage of microaggressions, everyday pressures to conform, to hide their lack of belief, go through the motions, to wear a hijab, to marry a Muslim, and much more. I've known ex-Muslims who've had to pretend to fast or actually remain hungry and thirsty for days because they live under a watchful eye of a religious family member. Many of the younger apostates are unable to be out about their beliefs because they rely on their families for financial support, not to mention the emotional dependence ingrained into all of us as part of Muslim family structures. But the more ex-Muslims speak up and reclaim the terms kafir, murtad, and with them their right to be heard, their rights as humans to follow their own conscience without having to pretend, the more Islamists lose that ideological power that comes from their divinely ordained right to define who is and isn't human. One of the best and most efficient ways to stave off Islamism is to give platforms to diverse ex-Muslim voices. Diluting the identity politics that is the lifeblood of Islamism is possible. Moderate Muslims often avoid supporting ex-Muslims, perhaps out of a fear of being called kafir themselves. But more and more are realizing that we are not anti-Muslim. We may criticize Islam like we do all religions, but we stand in solidarity with anyone, including Muslims, when they are being targeted out of hatred and xenophobia. Allowing the space for apostasy can give breathing room for variations and reformations within Islam as well. Islamists want us to believe that by leaving Islam, we lose our place as humans and we lose our identities, but we don't. What we actually lose is their hold on our definitions for ourselves. For us, Islamists no longer get to define what is and isn't human. We think for ourselves, and that is what really, really scares them about us. We ex-Muslims like to use LGBTQ lingo, like coming out, because there are actually striking similarities among the lived experiences of both types of people. The dehumanization and isolation they face within their own families and communities. Yesterday was actually coming out day. So I see this conference as a celebration for many ex-Muslims who have come out to each other and to themselves, and to those who will find inspiration in the days and the conversations to come. Thank you. Thanks very much. And as a non-Muslim and as a non-human, I would say that, you know, let more and more people come out from more and more of um, closets, wherever they are, and whichever religion they are.